Dana White, make these fights. UFC 299 went down last night and we saw Sean O'Malley defend the bantamweight belt against Marlon Chido Vera. This video, I'm going to discuss all of the matchups that I believe Dana White needs to make following the event. I want to jump right into things, so make sure you guys smash the likes, and if you're new to the channel, subscribe. First and foremost, at the top, Sean O'Malley versus Ilya Taporia. He called for this matchup immediately following the UFC 299 win. I believe it makes sense. We have star power not only on O'Malley's side, but also on Taporia's side. And you have Sean O'Malley, who's really good-sized for the featherweight division. He's not moving up, giving up height or reach. He actually has the advantage in both departments over the current champion, Ilya Taporia, at 145. I saw Dana White's post-fight presser, and he was a little bit lacking enthusiasm for this potential super fight which was a complete flip to what we saw from Joe Rogan following the event. He seemed like he was all in and even said he'd be willing to go to Spain to call the fight. And if you know anything about Joe Rogan, he does not leave the United States for UFC events anymore. So him saying that is massive. And I think that Spain card could be an absolute super card. And you're going there for the first time. You have to have a mega main event. If you look at the UFC featherweight division, are you going to give Brian Ortega the shot? Now, I know Marab is the number one contender at bantamweight. And unfortunately, that's just th how things go sometimes he might have to give up the shot and give up some time and maybe even fight for an interim belt against Corey Sanhagen because the champion has that star power maybe to the level of a Conor McGregor I mean he defended the belt Conor never defended a title and got the fight up a weight class against the champion right granted yes he fought Nate Diaz twice in the meantime of that but still I believe that Sean O'Malley fighting Ilya Taporia is huge it's a bigger fight than Marab versus Sean O'Malley and the Marab fight will still be there regardless of the outcome of the Ilya Zaporia fight. So it's kind of a win-win situation. I'm saying we do Marab Sanhagen interim belt. We go to Spain and we do Zaporia versus Sean O'Malley in an absolute mega fights in a battle of the new stars right now in the UFC. I want to see it. I'm in for it. I think it'd be a mistake for the UFC not to book it. Not saying that I believe Marab is definitely going to beat Sean O'Malley, but he is a tough matchup. And what if somehow he did take out O'Malley? It kills the possibility of that super fight. People say, oh, well, then he wouldn't have deserved it. Doesn't matter. I don't want to know. What I want to see is the stylistic clash between two elite level strikers and Ilya Taporia and Sean O'Malley. And I'll be honest with you, Sean O'Malley's distance striking is going to be a problem for Taporia. Now, Ilya Taporia has something that the vast majority of bantamweights do not have. The kill switch, which is insane knockout power. And if he lands a clean shot on the chin, he could flatten Sean O'Malley. But I love that possibility. That fight intrigues the hell out of me. It definitely scares Sean O'Malley. And if he's calling for it right after his UFC 299 win, I think that's the direction you have to go down. Dana's talking about how big of a star O'Malley is and how this was a record-breaking event, number four gate revenue of all time, and it was like one of the biggest fights ever, not held with Conor McGregor in the main event. How do you not push him into a super fight? O'Malley has that thing, that star power, that magical touch. And even though he lacks the charisma of Conor McGregor, the style that he has and the skill set, incredible. I want to see him fight Ilya Tapuria up a weight class. O'Malley has even stated that having the belt is cool, but he feels like he's becoming bigger than the belt, which is definitely a McGregor-type mentality. And I think a world title fight, up a weight class versus Ilya Tapuria super fight should be booked next. That's what I think for Sean O'Malley's next fight. Dana White, book it. Next one is Dustin Poirier versus the Gate Sheet Holloway winner. I know that Ali Abdelaziz said, I want to see Makachev versus Poirier in June, but Ali is not a UFC matchmaker. He looks at Poirier and he kind of thinks favorable matchup for Makachev 100% because we saw what Benoit Saint-Denis was able to do with him on the ground. He had good control time. He had some submission attempts there. He was doing damage from top. He was winning the fight until he got cracked with big shots and he wasn't. Now, this matchup between Gaethje and Holloway, the winner of that would be determined for who's next for Poirier. My early prediction has been Justin Gaethje, but Holloway is looking absolutely jacked and seems like he's becoming a real UFC lightweight. 
We've seen Poirier Holloway before, but it was a Holloway that didn't fill into a 155-pound frame. We've seen Gaethje Poirier twice before, and we had two legendary fights. I don't think anybody is complaining about a Poirier Gaethje trilogy for the BMF belt or a Poirier Holloway rematch for the BMF title. I think it would be criminal for Poirier to jump the line ahead of Charles Oliveira or Armand Sarukian or even Justin Gaethje. Three of those fighters, all of them, fighting at UFC 300. And Dana White has promised the winner of Oliveira Saruki in a world title fight. I don't think he's going back on his word and just giving it to Poirier because he beat number 13, Benoit saint -Denis. Now, he looked good doing it. It was an emphatic knockout. It was fight of the night. It was a dope matchup. And I still think the stock of Poirier rose. But it rose to the BMF belt. I don't think it rose to him getting the world title next. You lose the fight prior, and now he's jumping ahead of everybody in front of him. I mean, he lost to Oliveira and he lost to Gaethje previously, and he's going to jump the line in front of both of them. Circumstances and timelines occasionally can work out like that. Like we saw Cheeto Vera get a shot, even though he had a loss to Sanhagen, who's a top-ranked contender ahead of him. But I don't think this circumstance works out like that. I think Poirier versus the Gaethje Holloway winner for the BMF belt in either a trilogy or a rematch is what I think is next. And I think it would do huge numbers for the UFC. That's what I want. Dana White, book it up. Next one, Benoit saint -Denis versus Benil Dariush. Bad losses for both men. For Darius, he's coming off two brutal knockout losses in a row. But we have to take positives away from Benoit's performance. He was fighting with a staph infection and did admit to being on antibiotics. His grappling power is incredible. If you have him full-fledged, not on antibiotics, I assume the gas tank doesn't wilt and he can keep that high pace up for multiple rounds. And if he had another round of it, he may have submitted Dustin Poirier because it's not like Poirier wasn't feeling the effects of the grappling attack and pressure. I think that Benoit is still on the path to being a legit contender. He's in his mid-20s right now. He doesn't have head movement, which is definitely a fatal flaw. And, you know, he got cracked up bad by Dustin Poirier. But Benil Dariush doesn't have that type of boxing skill. I do believe Benil Dariush has deteriorated and he's past his best days. And yes, Dariush may be a bit of a sacrificial lamb here to get Benoit saint back in the top title picture of the UFC lightweight division. But I want to see it. Benoit saint and Dariush is actually the matchup that I thought should have been next after Benoit saint last fight, which was a win over Matt Frivola. Instead, they jumped him way ahead in the rankings and gave him a massive opportunity against Dustin Poirier, which he ended up not being ready for per se. But I think he'll be ready for Benil Dariush. Don't count out Benoit just because of this loss here. I believe he can come back. The dude still has a killer mentality. He still has killer takedowns and pressure. And honestly, he's got a tricky frame to deal with for the vast majority of guys in the UFC light heavy, lightweight division. Excuse me. I'm doing St. Denis Dariush next. That's what I want. Book that fight. Yeah, I'm in. Next one is Jack Della Maddalena versus Shavka Rachmanov. Now, initially, I was not ever going to call this. I wouldn't have said to make this fight next. But Jack Della called out Shavkat, and if you call out the boogeyman of your division, and before that you knock out Gilbert Burns, I think you give it to him. It becomes a true number one contender fight. Now, a reason this wouldn't happen would be if Shavkat Rachmanov is going to jump the line and fight for the world title against Leon Edwards, but Bilal Muhammad has done enough to really earn that shot. Now, I understand. I know the comments now will say, bro, he doesn't move a needle. Nobody wants to see Bilal. Elite win streak, a no contest in the first fight. I still think it warrants a title shot for Bilal Muhammad. Shavkat versus JDM is a massive fight. And the winner of Shavkat JDM becomes a clear-cut number one contender. And I would be very intrigued in that fight. I want to see it next. I think that JDM Shavkat should happen. Battle of the new generation of talent, which I think is epic. I do believe that Jack Della's striking and grappling defense could give Shavkat a lot of problems on the feet, but Shavkat's elite level wrestling and top control is going to be something difficult to deal with for Jack Della Maddalena. And he was losing on two out of the three judges' scorecards with his fight with Burns, right? So he had a comeback win according to the scorecards, even though I do believe he won the first round by a little bit on my card. But I'm not an official judge for the UFC. And if it would have went the distance, Jack Della would have lost the fight. Instead, comeback knockout win, calling out Shavkat right after, book it. Marlon Chido Vera versus Song Yadong 2. Marlon needs some serious time off because he absorbed a ton of damage. 
And I don't think it's a bad idea for Song Yudong to take some time off either. He's been pretty damn active. And he took some damage against Piotr Jan as well. Both guys are very high-level contenders. And their first fight ended via controversial decision. It went to Song Yudong. But the vast majority of people that watched the fight felt that it should have been Marlon Cheeto Vera's fight. And it was also at 145 pounds featherweight division as opposed to their true weight classes, which is bantamweight 135. Both for now are out of the title picture. And I think it's an intriguing fight as well as a fan-friendly matchup that makes a lot of sense. It'd be a pretty epic fight night main event. I think we got to do Cheeto Vera versus Song Yedong too. I want to see that rematch. I want a conclusive answer to who gets it. It'd be a crazy fight as well because Cheeto Vera's chin is out of this world. Song Yedong, one of the most heavy-handed guys. And even in loss against Piotr Jan, I still think he looked pretty good. Marlon Vera, Song Yedong too. They had a little back and forth as well at the 299 pre-fight presser. Let's make it happen. Jan versus the Figueredo Garbrandt winner. Listen, Piotr Jan was able to beat a force in Song Yedong yesterday, and I think it was a massive moment for him. He had a hard first round. Figueredo and Garbrandt are fighting at UFC 300, and I think there's a bit of history between Figueredo and Jan as far as the sense that Figueredo was world champion at flyweight when Jan was the king at bantamweight, and there was talks and ideas about how that clash would have went when they were matched up, and I honestly thought that the size difference would have been a factor at that moment, not height-wise, because Jan's short, but the natural frame, but Figueredo has filled into a bantamweight frame beautifully, and if he goes out there and looks impressive against Cody Garbrandt, how could you not give him the fight against Piotr Jan? Now, I am picking Figueredo to beat Cody Nolov, but if Garbrandt is able to win, Team Alpha Male's taking L's on L's on L's against Piotr Jan, and we saw the run-in years ago after Uriah Faber was KO'd by Piotr Jan. Garbrandt was in the face of Jan talking some shit. And even though Garbrandt may be cross-training at other gyms at this point, I still think he's team alpha male for life. And he'd like to get one back. Yadong's an alpha male guy. Obviously, Uriah Faber, alpha male guy. They're taking some L's to Piotr Jan. And the stylistic matchup would be fun because Cody Garbrandt's one of the better boxers in the UFC bantamweight division. At one point, he'd be considered the best Jan is making the claim that he's the best boxer. I mean, he did do great against Sean O'Malley, whose striking's out of this world. If Garbrandt's taking Figgy out, I think Piotr Jan versus Garbrandt is a fight to make. So either matchup makes a lot of sense to me. Jan should be fighting probably backwards, right? Because Figueredo and Garbrandt will be ranked behind them. And I think that it makes a lot of sense. Let's do it. The winner of those two versus Piotr Jan next. Huge fight. And UFC 300's damn stacked. I can't wait for it. And I think we get an answer into who Piotr Jan's next opponent will be. Next one, heavyweights, Rebellis to Spain versus Chris Beast Boy Barnett. It's a weird fight that would be super fun to watch. You have almost a foot in height favoring to Spain, and you have over a foot in reach favoring Rebellis to Spain. It's another favorable matchup for him. I'll be honest. Chris Barnett is going to be put in a rough spot fighting Rebellis to Spain. It's a fan-friendly fighter in Chris Barnett who's definitely going to look to strike and bring some action, but he's probably going to be outmatched substantially. Now, we've seen Chris Barnett have trouble getting to the octagon. He hasn't fought since 2022, but I assume he'd love to get back in the cage as soon as possible. I believe he had a fight booked for March. I think timeline might work out where his uh, recovery will be set forth that maybe June time... Right, Early summer, late spring, we could see Rebellis to Spain come in and fight Chris Barnett. And also, it's another bit of a layup and a fun fight for Rebellis to Spain because he's going to emerge as a top 15 fighter. But it's now the time to work on closing some of the potential holes. Now, we haven't seen him on his back. We don't know if he has horrible grappling. I'm assuming that you know as he moves up the ranks, we'll find out our answer. Chris Barnett's a favorable matchup, but it gives him time to sharpen the tools, and I think that's great for a fighter with only five fights. Now, I know he is 35 years of age, but at heavyweight, you can fight till 42, 43. Some of these guys peak later, and I think Rebellis to Spain looks to be in his absolute prime right now and still developing as a fighter on the come-up. He's a 35-year-old prospect, but with a couple more wins, could be a contender. I don't want to rush him to the top 15. That's why I'm giving him Chris Barnett. Initially, I thought, okay, if I'm giving him the fast-track treatment, let's do the Waldo Cortez Acosta fight. But as I thought about it more, I said, man, the Spain just beat Josh Parisian, who's one of the worst heavyweights on the roster. I think that Barnett is definitely a step up in competition, but a super favorable fight, which obviously height, reach, athleticism, power, 
all favoring Rebellis. So I want to see Rebellis to Spain versus Chris Beast Boy Barnett. I'm sorry that we're sacrificing Beast Boy Barnett because he's an awesome guy, but that's how the game goes. And listen, he's got a chance to win. It's a fist fight, but the Spain is probably going to destroy him. And then the final of the fights that Dana White needs to make next, Michelle Pereira versus Gregory Robocop Rodriguez at UFC 301 in Brazil. Two violent fighters that are going to bring absolute entertainment because Robocop is one of the largest middleweights on the roster and Pereira being a former welterweight in the UFC, I want to see how he deals with the size of Robocop. Somebody that can strike, which he throws all power in every punch, but also he has elite level Brazilian jiu-jitsu. The thing is, Robocop is known for being a bit chinny. He gets caught inside, and I think that gives Pereira a good chance to knock him out. Now, I know Pereira is actually really sick with his jiu-jitsu as well, and he destroyed Mikhail Oleg Jacek with ease. It's a big fight feel. Like, even though I know Robocop three fights ago did lose to Bruno Ferreira, but he's on a two-fight win streak. He just knocked out Brad Tavares. I like the matchup a lot. It's a step to a fight that's just outside of the top 15. And that's what I think Michel Pereira should get next. And you have Battle of Brazilians too. And I think both guys will be ready for UFC 301. Let's make it happen in Brazil. Battle of Brazil, two super entertaining fighters. I think it's a guaranteed banger fight. Could end up being a damn fight of the night. Brazilian battle, say less. Dana White, book it. Those are all of the fights that I believe Dana White should book following UFC 299. So Dana White make these fights. I got my matchmaker hat on, and uh, I think that I have some good reads on what should be next for the key fighters on this UFC 299 fight card. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video, bringing back the fights to make next series. I hope you guys loved it. Let me know in the comments. I want to hear the opinions of the people. If you got nothing to say in the comments, but you just enjoy the content, as always, drop a W in the chat to boost the algorithm for your boy. Much love, everybody. Make sure you smash the likes on the way out. And if you're new, subscribe to the channel. Daily content, daily live streams. You don't want to miss it. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.